All right, we are live. Well, welcome everybody to the uh, first annual What's Happening podcast, or first annual, annual? first ever. First annual. Annual. This is not an, this is not an We're annual. We're only doing thing. this once a year. This, this is weekly. Tune in um, next year for our next topic. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We'll see you then. Next year's uh, topic. I'm going to propose 2022 as a topic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. We'll see what happens in the uh, the IT space over there. No, welcome to the first ever. There we go. That's why we have the buzzer, so that we can really. You we didn't know, even break. make it one minute without the buzzer. Uh, <laughs> people wouldn't expect well, anything less from us. I think it's all good. We're here for the first ever What's Happening podcast. Um, and we are here to talk about the ASUG market research that Avantra has done recently and to talk a little bit about the business side, the technical side, what's kind of happening in the AI ops automation space within the SAP ecosystem. So I'm Max Alaprandi. I'm here with Avantra and, and with my colleagues here, Brenton and Tyler. Do you guys want to say a quick hello? Hello. <laughs> hello. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Well, uh, for those of you who are who are new to this, um, which is us included, um, we're going to kind of run through some of this data that we experienced and uh, or that we found in this this research. And um, there's some you can feel free to ask questions live, and, and we'll try to get to those. Um, but um, for those of you who who haven't seen this research, is available on the Avantra website. But um, the research kind of focuses on the market of IT operations and and just kind of the new tools that are being adopted to transform businesses to kind of run more efficiently in the in the 21st century. So things like cloud, things like automation, things like AI ops, there's a lot of kind of uh, new words and new tools in this space. Um, so I thought it might be helpful since this is the first ever What's Happening podcast. Maybe we can just define what we mean by automation and what we mean by AI ops because these are kind of two important things. So when, when we talk about I, uh, uh, automation rather, what are the like workloads that are getting automated? What what's that really being implemented for by companies? Yeah, I think that's a good question actually. And, and Tyler and I did did um, one of these sessions, not these sessions, and other sessions specifically on um, what was it? Uh, zero touch automation, Tyler, wasn't it? Yeah, um, zero touch. And, and, and at the start of that one, we tried to define what is automation, what is zero touch automation, and how does it play in this space. And I thought we came up with a nice definition, which is automation is using machines to achieve processes without human involvement. I, I thought that was a nice kind of succinct definition of the automation um, stuff. Then we went for zero touch automation, which is, you know, hey, it's a much larger process, but there is no human involvement end to end. It kicks off by itself. It runs, it finishes, job done. Um, and then we, we kind of brought went on to the, AI ops stuff. And we started talking about intelligence uh, and intelligence being not necessarily the automation of the process, but the system being intelligent enough to know it should execute the process. Um, so so I, I thought they were kind of a, a nice progression starting with automation, zero touch automation, and then intelligent automation. Um, and, and to me, that's where the AI app stuff comes in, but hey, that, that's just my view. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's spot on. And you know, where I guess we'll probably talk about this more, but you know, where the industry is in that, specifically in the SAP world, um, I think is pretty interesting. Um, mm. so, you know, other IT workloads have definitely made some more progress, I believe, than the SAP side of things. But uh, I guess that's really what we're going to dive into today is how, where where's that at, and how does that all play? And when, I guess what you know, from the ASUG kind of thing, what, what's the industry thinking about it as well? Mm. Yeah, yeah. It, it, and it, I just think this research is interesting because it's kind of a timestamp of where this market is at, it, you know, in real time, mid pandemic, where mm. everything sort of has changed fairly quickly um, at this kind of crucial juncture of business yeah. transformation. So it. it but is, isn't that interesting in itself, though, Max, though, because you would you would almost think in some ways that something like a pandemic, like what we've seen over the last 12, 18 months would slow things down. And, you know. I'm having conversations with customers day in, day out, and I'm seeing exactly the opposite, which mm -hmm. is almost a doubling down. Now is the time I must automate stuff. And 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 it, it almost feels like people are kind of going, right, things are going to get back to normal, hopefully very soon. So why don't I spend right now automating and getting the stuff I wouldn't normally have had time to focus on done 
so that when I do get back to normal, I'm running and I'm doing some stuff better than the way I used to do it. So, which I think is a fascinating, you know, <laughs> difference to what people expect when they hear, oh, hey, how has the pandemic affected your business? Um, right. Yeah. You know, just one, what it's, I'm hearing it over and over again from customers and conversations. I think that's fascinating. So, what, what, so a question to you guys. So I was thinking about this this morning. So do you guys think the, this, this whole pandemic, did people go right from pandemic to automation? Or do you think it was more of, okay, this is a completely new change or everything's changed, it's completely mm -hmm. new. They kind of tore everything down to nothing. And then in the rebuilding of how to, to now work, automation was part of it. And I, I, you know, I wasn't really sure, is that something that, Again, did people go right from, uh oh, something new, automation, or is it a, a tear down and rebuild? Automation is part of it. Uh, I think the first part, at least from my perspective, was not necessarily pairing it back to zero, but figuring out and, and realizing that they could do the majority of what they did before in, in a world where they couldn't travel, they couldn't get out of the house, they had to do it from home. Um, so I think there was a bit of a realization that, oh, you know what, the world hasn't ended. Um, and we haven't had to pair back to zero because you know what we can do about 60, 70, 80, 90%. Um, and then to me, the automation has been um, both an em embracing of how do I get back to 100% while still in this pandemic situation, but also then realizing that there are necessities that need to be undertaken, like security, for example. Um, how do you focus on that even more and the automation that 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 is focused on that as well? Um, so I think it's kind of, there's a, there's a fork there, um, but they didn't go all the way back to zero, in my opinion. But maybe that's just me. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. No, that, that's a really good point, Brenton. Like, there's these things that people have to do, and and in in light of a tough situation, it's like, okay, well, actually, there are things that we can streamline right now, and we don't have to just kind of throw our hands up. And uh, it seems like IT operations has been a big space where people have been able to make these these leaps. Um, and and it was in the it was in the I guess uh, what people were thinking about it was it was somewhere somewhere near top of mind. We saw in the research, fifty nine percent of respondents were planning to implement AI and ML this year, um, mm -hmm. and another fifty six percent are interested in like predictive analysis and and how that folds into AI. And you know we've seen cloud get really big in the last eighteen months, and and automation is getting a little bit more popular. So those were seventy five and sixty percent already in use. So seventy five percent of people say they're already using cloud in some capacity, 60% say they're already using automation. And it seems like the AI and the ML are, are slightly less entrenched and they're kind of making their way um, into, the, into the popularity. Um, so as this is all growing in footprint, I, I think the, the pandemic has certainly expedited the need for that. And so, but I'm I, I, where I come into this is kind of you know what does that mean for people running, you know your average administrator, your average consultant running mm -hmm. SAP as this all is coming on. I think there's been a lot of fear in in the industry for many years as what AI is going to replace and what you know all of that. Um, but what are we actually seeing with people that we talk to or like you know when right. we get those firsthand experiences? Yeah, I'll jump in here. I, I think I'm seeing quite a bit of kind of crawl, walk, run um, type of mentality um, where, you know, quite a few people are crawling. You know, they, hey, they, they've, they've kind of dipped the toe in the water. They've got some automations in place. And that's the people who get to say, hey, you know what? We've got some automation. And that's great. Um, but they're starting to, and, and, and this is great to see, people are realizing that it's a journey. It's not, hey, AIML, let's do that tomorrow. You don't just get there tomorrow. You, you you kind of start today with, hey, what can I automate? Now, how can I add intelligence to the triggering of that automation? Now, how can I add trend analysis to those situations so that I'm even adding the AI element to this intelligent automation? So it's kind of, to me, it's it's really this crawl, walk, run. And we're seeing people go on that journey more and more. Um, and... I, I, definitely. I mean, I was having a conversation with one of one of our our, our customers in the UK recently, and and the, the guy said to me, he said, "We're in the, the the kind of walk stage where they're really starting to automate lots of stuff." But a big part of that one, which is and maybe I'm digressing here, and, and stop me, Max, if I am. But he said we're having to shift the mentality of our folks away from manual to automation, and that is probably one of the biggest areas he's spending his time. Um, just purely because it takes time for people to realize, oh, 
I've done this three times this week. Maybe I should automate it. Um, so, so anyway, that's just a little nugget I think I'm picking up on um, from conversations. Yeah. And Brenton, I think you and I talk about this all the time. Um, <laughs> yeah. That, that people in the SAP world are just have been reluctant and slow to get into the automation world for whatever reason. And um, Well, it's been hard, hasn't it? I mean, yeah. if, if, you, if, if you looked at something like, you know, automated kernel upgrades, like what we're doing now, that is hard. That and, and you might you might be able to automate it once, but keeping that automation functioning when things change, I mean that's right. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. hard. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, so I um, I was down in uh, Sydney at the um, the Australia SAP User Group. I think it's SAUG. last week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not, not in the last year. This is uh, I think three or four years ago. And uh, mm -hmm. I was talking to someone that is, um, is a managed service provider, or he worked for a managed service provider in New Zealand. And um, he is non SAP, but mm. his what he was trying to do was automate as much as he possibly could mm -hmm. for the SAP consulting staff. And so that was refreshes, client copies, mm -hmm. kernel updates, all this stuff. And even me three years ago, I, I was not a firm. I, I didn't have the belief that I do now that we, we've kind of proven things out now, but that kind of like you crazy. Like that's not going to work. And he's like, yeah, that's what everyone tells me. But you know, it took a non SAP person to come in and say, guys, we can do this. You know, he had like three or four tools behind what he was scripting and all doing all this stuff. But it was really interesting that it took someone to come in and kind of be a bull in a China shop and say, listen, yes, we know, you know, SAP, I don't, but I'm going to help do this. And you know, that they kind of went from there. So, now fast forward to where we are today and you know now there's all kinds of stuff going on and i think you know the 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 market is still getting there slowly i kind of just, like mm -hmm. you're saying it's a, you know people are starting to crawl now but you know i think in the coming years or it's just really going to ramp up i think the, the believers yeah. will start to out. and i think sap themselves are embracing some of some of the the automation requirements that come with their own journey to being a cloud company. I mean, what was it? Ten years ago, they announced, "Hey, we're a cloud company." You know, not, but realistically, with the scale of SAP products that are in the market, that was always going to be a journey. So they themselves are on that journey, and we see more and more and more of it becoming cloud native, which is great. Um, and and I do, in my mind, rightly or wrongly, equate cloud native applications with automation and, and the capability to be automated because suddenly you're talking about situations where you've got open APIs, you've got the ability to script the what, what happens around and within these landscapes. Um, so I, th I think that's a journey SAP themselves are on and it's becoming easier as a result for the rest of us as they go through that evolution. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I have right. kids in the background. <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, it's, it's for me, this kind of, you know, and I'm not a super technical person, but this kind of l leads me to think that this, just as the landscapes are growing more complex, this has sort of dawned on people. Like, we're going to need this, whether that's now or in six months or in a year, um, as these systems are growing more and more complex with cloud and whatnot, the automation almost has to come with it, like you're saying, Brenton. Um, and so, and, and I thought it was interesting from this research that with that growing complexity, there just comes this, this technical overload that's, you know, we, we hear from people of like, they're just getting hundreds of email alerts every day that they're not even sure what system it's coming from. And, uh, and there's a 33% chance of a higher cost and a lack of consistencies when you start to add on these new tools and, and if the management hasn't kind of kept up. Um, so and this may be uh, this may actually not be super germane, but I, I'm kind of curious myself about smart clouds because I keep hearing this word around. So is that just about infusing automation into the smart cloud, like you're saying, Brenton, that they kind of go together, or you know, walk me through that a little bit. Tyler, you go first because I need to sure. think about that one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sorry to put you on the spot, Brenton. No, it's all good. So, really, so you know, getting back to the the was it thirty three percent. Higher, you know, when running on the cloud and, and mm -hmm. using um, intelligence into the cloud. So, I think what happened a lot and still is happening is when people migrate to the cloud, they're doing it, and I, I hate to say it wrong, they're doing it the wrong way, but they're doing a forklift where they're essentially just taking their right. system, they're plopping it on a public cloud and walking away saying, hey, we're on the cloud. Well, you can't scale, you can't do anything like that. It really starts way back before 
even do the migration when you're starting to architect this whole thing out. And you have to make sure that when you're architecting your systems on a public cloud, starting to utilize solutions that can scale your systems and that can do that kind of thing. And I'm not just talking scale up, scale down, like you know, adding CPU and memory. All the public cloud providers can do that already. That, and that's great if you're able to architect that too. But also being able to scale out because there are performance metrics within SAP that will not show on the OS level, will not show in the database layer, but will have dramatic mm -hmm. performance problems for your organization. And that's where you start to scale out, adding additional application servers, what have you, or, or all kinds of things. And there, there's more than beyond that too. But you know, I think so. That's that's you know why people might be paying more than they initially planned is because again they just forklifted the whole thing on there and they don't need to do that at all. Yeah, I, I I'm I'm in agreement with that, and I I would probably if I'm going to take a slightly different approach to this, which is the more business approach, which is if I'm in the process or if I'm midway through uh, or planning a cloud jump. Um, I would definitely be looking at this from so many different angles um, to try and get as much benefit, um, both you know before, during, and and if you ever get to a point of what we consider after, but you know kind of is. Um, but you need to be looking at kind of going right. Okay, the cloud gives me these so many opportunities. What opportunities am I going to employ when on this journey? to try and give myself a boost um, and to give myself competitive advantage and to give myself X, Y, and Z so that you're starting to drop out those business benefits throughout the journey. Um, and I think if you do have somebody and you have a function that is taking that holistic view of the entire journey and able to understand, identify, and implement these cloud native benefits, throughout the journey you're going to you're, you're you're going to immediately have a better journey it's rather than exactly what you said Tyler. So, you know so many people we've seen it ourselves i've seen it customers go oh boom, boom, boom. excellent i'm in the cloud great i'm on the line <laughs> um <laughs> you know so uh, you know if you take that approach of course you'll get to the cloud you'll get to say you went to the cloud and it will be the fastest migration ever to the cloud but you'll be you'll you'll be getting no benefit um, so to me, it's it's about what benefit comes throughout the journey, and what are you going to do differently at each point. That 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 to me, I'm not sure if that answers your question, Max, but that that's quite important to me. No, that, the, the journey part I think is really good. I think that's an awesome thing that you just said there because you're, you're right. It, it's not an overnight. What did I say? <laughs> <laughs> the whole you know migrating to the cloud is not. An overnight activity you know some do it pretty some we've seen some organizations do it really quick but let's just be yep. honest 90 percent of it, it it's you're usually in a hybrid environment or you're in something some form and you're right what are the benefits throughout that that that's a really key point yeah so <clears throat> i just want to highlight a, we got a question from uh mm. from the audience uh it says what could cure my memory issues and i'm not sure that came up within the last minute or two um I'm not sure if that does that make sense to you guys. Uh, a question it's of quite memory. A broad issues. question. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm thinking I maybe see, with with cloud. I assume they mean like technical, right? Mm. Yeah. Oh, the scalability with cloud. cloud. Uh, Bad joke. <laughs> <laughs> with, cloud, <laughs> with sort of cloud memory, I think is is what uh, what they're getting at is if there's issues with cloud memory. Well, I saw this pop up kind of um, sh shortly after, and there's probably a little bit of a delay, but shortly after you were mentioning the scale up, scale out conversation, Tyler. So perhaps okay. it's linked to that. Um, yeah. And as you were saying, there's metrics there that don't show up at the OS level. There's and, and some that do. So it's, it's probably a good question from that standpoint. Yeah. So uh, that is, I mean, without being able to get into the specifics of the system, that, that's really hard, hard to answer. But with that being said, I think this actually is a great point to start bringing up the uh, the AI stuff because when you're looking at an SAP system and you've got memory issues, you know, is it something at the database layers or something at the application layers? It's, you know, it could be bad code. It could be something's not tuned correctly. There's a thousand different things that could be happening. So sorry, it's not cut and actually. Right. No, but actually, this this brings up a good point. And Max, maybe you can answer this one. So whoever asked the question. What's the best way for them to get in contact with you so that we can have a follow-on conversation after this at some point to 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 see if we can help them with that question? Yeah, so I um, 
I should probably have put my email somewhere on this Bright Talk <laughs> chat so that if anybody has these questions or anything and they want to get in touch, they should do that. Um, so going forward, I'll have uh, my email on this on these Bright Talk uh, descriptions. Cool. But that that email is just Max, my first name, uh, M A X uh, dot Aliprandi, which is A L I P R A N D I at Avantra. I won't repeat that, uh, but um, we'll, we'll put it up there in the future. And I, I think we can retroactively kind of add it to this description so that if you ever want to get in touch and ask any questions like that, we can totally get those answered. And, the, and I think you, that you've got contact forms on the website as well, uh, avantra.com. So you know, hit, hit us up on one of those. One of us will pick, pick it up as well, um, for sure. I, just, th I think that's an interesting question, but it's so broad. That could be worth a follow-up for sure. Yeah, and absolutely. I, and I think putting, so just to kind of, Piggyback on that. So, but putting a solution in place that that will have some some AI is going to help might help pinpoint what that that is because again, it could be exactly all different areas, all different things, and then even building out. So, if if it is if you're always constantly having memory problems, that's one thing. If it's something that's that's happening from time to time, you know, having a solution that can recognize that something abnormal is happening can then go out and what Brenton was saying way back in the beginning is that's what's going to trigger the automation to go resolve whatever that issue may be. So um, context so is king. What's that? Sorry. Context is king. Yes. Yes. With with automation, context is king. There we go. That's my that's my phrase for the day. I'm done. Bye bye. <laughs> 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 that buzzer's gonna be a saving grace for us on this journey here. Oh yeah. Um, absolutely. So uh, I, I want to go back because, Brenton, you said something that made me think of security. And I, I can't remember exactly mm. what you said. Um, but I know that's kind of top of mind for, for a lot of folks as they're kind of um, – as they're on this business transformation journey and adding cloud and adding these things. And like you were saying, they're trying to give themselves some success along the way. And it's not um, – you know, it's not going to solve itself overnight, but they can't wait two years for it to kind of get up and running either. But security sure. is this kind of like through line through everything where you have to maintain because it's just this arms race all the time. So when when you have this 33% chance of higher cost and, and uh, just unnecessary complexity uh, as you're mm -hmm. growing this stuff, um, in those rare cases of breaches or, or you know the fallout from that, both technically and at a brand level can be kind of radioactive. Are there... Mm -hmm. Are there things out there that automation and AI ops specifically do to kind of address the security issue? Um, and, and partially this may be, um, I, I'm not sure if I'm fielding you or, or I'm not sure if I'm giving you a, a fair no, question. That's, it, it's a, um, it, no, that's, it's a good question. I mean, it's a broad question. Don't get me wrong. Is security important? Absolutely. Um, I mean, it was before, but now with, you know, hey, all three of us, guess where we're sitting? We're sitting in our own homes. Um, you know, on our own Wi-Fi's, hopefully not our neighbors' Wi-Fi's. You know, and, and we're, we're, you know, <laughs> hopefully not. Oops. <laughs> um, but you know, and, and that's a simple example. But I, I think, in the context of uh, operations, IT operations, SAP operations, um, you want to find the the tools and and the methodologies, the automations, whatever you want to call it, that help you to do the right thing in a frictionless manner. Right. So um, let's take the example we had earlier. So the kernel upgrades. So SAP release a kernel every month or two, sometimes more frequently, sometimes less frequently. Um, it's the foundation of an SAP system. It's kind of something you want to keep up to date as frequently as possible, because that's where the security loopholes come from. Um, you know, if you, if, you, if you subscribe to, and I do, the, the SAP kind of hotfix alerts and, and the, the, the critical vulnerability uh, disclosures that happened to every software company. I'm not picking on SAP. Microsoft have them. Apple have them. It's 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 from everyone. Um, but if you're subscribing to those, you're seeing them coming in every single month. And you know, it's a score out of ten. It's nine point eight out of ten. You know, nine point nine out of ten. Um, you know, they're the things that you want to turn around and go right. I want that applied very quickly in my landscape. How do I do that? What's going to enable me to do that fast? Um, and also in a, in a way that isn't going to impact the business. Um, so, so to me, if, if you're talking about security, you want to look at the operations tools, platforms, what are processes, automations, 
that will help you to do the right thing more frequently um, to protect mm -hmm. the business. Um, that's a good starting point. Um, and even, for example, making sure that your operating systems on all of your servers, they run their updates at least once a month straight after Patch Tuesday or whatever the case may be. You know, it's little things like that. They're basic automations, but you know what? They're the ones that will help you in the long run. Um, the, the challenge with those, and you know me, I like coming full circle to take the technical to the business. Um, the challenge with some of this stuff is unless it's going wrong, it can be difficult to celebrate this to the business. So, hey, I automated all of our kernel upgrades and all of our OS upgrades. Business person is going, well, what does that mean? And what does that, what does that do for me? Nothing. Right. All it does is it prevents something that they didn't have in the first place. It, it prevents an outage. It prevents a security incident. Um, so that can be quite a challenge. So getting the management, getting your, your CISOs, getting your CXOs on board with the fact that this is a critical area. And, you know, guess what? There's news stories from the last three weeks, solar winds, whatever you want to talk about that you can point to and say, this is important. Let's, let's focus on this. Um, that can be a good justification for going down the route. But it's a little bit fear mongering, but you get my point. I'll, I'll pause there. But that's my initial thought on, on the broad question of security in the context of automation and operations. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, when you were just talking about the kernel updates and things like that, I think that often mm -hmm. gets overlooked when we talk security. Because, you know, mm. when we talk security just in general, but in organization, specifically IT, you think of, you know, the firewalls. The are, you know, what's that? Firewalls and network. Right, yeah, and... yeah. You start to think about that. Yeah. And there's all kinds of solutions in the market, and that gets a ton of attention. You know, you're going to prevent mm -hmm. people from coming in to do something malicious in your network. But there's this element of SAP that needs this of level security. And I'm not talking SAP user administration security, like mm -hmm. technical yeah. security that often gets overlooked. And that's like Brenton just said, it's the kernel updates. It's making sure that things are at your company, the, uh, the profile parameters are within your company's policies and that you know, no SAS yep. stars, lockdown, all these things that oftentimes get overlooked, that when you do things like refreshes and things like that, if you don't have those things automated, they're going to get left behind because just we're all human. Things could happen, you know, and next thing you know, it's your audit. So being able to watch those things constantly, monitor those things, automate those things, that's really going to drive consistency and make sure that all those security aspects are locked down as well. I, I mean, that, that's actually, you, you said another magic word, which I think is great for justification of focus on this stuff. So the audit word, um, audits are <laughs> a pain. They're very necessary. Don't get me wrong. They uncover things that none of us think of. It's, it's brilliant. Um, but the, the, the process of going through an audit can be quite challenging and quite painful for the teams. Whereas, you know, if you implement the right tools, um, and you will have multiple tools depending on the areas of your landscape, blah, blah, blah. And you can hit buttons that spit out audit reports. That mean that when someone says, hey, we're getting audited, you go, dum, 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 dum. Thank you very much. <laughs> Bye-bye. As Brent, opposed would to... You say, would you dare say audits could be fun now? <laughs> <laughs> I did not say that. <laughs> but I, I but no, think you raised... It, it, it's not, it's not, but just, just to finish the point though, Max, it's not clearing the next three weeks to get ready. It's bum, bum, bum. Right, there we go. right. <laughs> well, I, I, I think you raise a really interesting point of like, you know, the, the world has changed so much. And I think people are starting to realize there are easier ways to do this. And there are, there mm -hmm. are probably better and faster and safer ways to do this. Um, and they've, it's, people have known about it for a while, but now we're kind of in this, critical moment where not only does everybody know about it, but they see the importance of it and they're, they are starting to kind of build uh, traction with it. And, it, you know, security is one area that I think has helped nudge that along maybe. Um, and similar, similarly to that, you know, compliance and, and, and um, you know, for, for audits and all of that. Um, I, I thought it was interesting that these in, in terms of what customers are looking for, it kind of goes along with that. It says, um, the, the research suggested that monitoring and analytics are the number one choice of what people want to see in AI ops. And, and, and that's 59% followed by upgrades and patching and, and performance management. And it, it's, it really seems like that ability to look into the system and, and ensure that it is running the way it should and that audits can be easy, that systems can be secure and we don't have to be wondering oh. when the next level 10 explosion is going to happen. Like, and I mean, this is huge for a lot of industries and manufacturing, pharmaceutical, energy. I mean, most everybody. 
Um, and if this stuff is so important, um, it really does seem kind of... Uh, the next evolution of operations, right? Yeah, totally organic. Like, we're there. Exactly. Now, uh, before we go dive into that, I do want to point out that that's really cool. Because obviously, we have our notes that you prepared, Max, for the questions you were going to kind of focus on. And you highlighted what's on your screen as you were talking through it. And it highlighted on the screen beside me that you had highlighted it. That's really cool because it drew my attention to where you were asking. Anyway, <laughs> so, slide aside, I love that. That that's that's a really cool feature, of Google Docs. Um, but no, it is becoming more organic. And but th then, isn't that an interesting evolution that is going to become standard across the board? That the companies that succeed, thrive, and push the boat out are going to be the ones where this becomes business as usual. Now, what's what's really interesting is if you take the, the pre-pandemic world, um. Companies that were able to achieve that kind of step forward in how people think, especially in things like this, you know, audit compliance um, and, 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 and whatnot, they were generally the, the upstarts. It was, you know, the people trot out the Ubers and that kind of, or the, the disruptors who came into a market because they were small and agile. They were doing this stuff better. And so they leapfrogged the competition. What's really interesting is that in, in the pandemic world, where from an operational standpoint, everyone is kind of scrambling to make this the next level in order to compete with everybody who's waiting to go again and um, when 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 all of this comes to an end uh, i'm not sure if i'm making a huge amount of sense but it, it to to me it's quite interesting to see everybody try to make this leap at the exact same time rather than be leapfrogged by an upstart or or a more agile um uh, new entry into the market Right. I mean, I think there was just, a, especially there's just a lot of businesses that were not born digital. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for the, for those that were born digital, a lot of this stuff is kind of, um, you know, it's old hat. They've, they've been using complex data gathering and monitoring and all this stuff for, right. for a, a long time. It's kind of built into their DNA. For the businesses that were born before that, this is kind of a new, uh, it was a slower process to kind of get the need for that. Um, but it is, it, it is there. Um, I'm, I'm just, uh, you've reminded me, I'm not deliberately looking down. I, I, I am looking at my phone. I'm trying to find the name of a book um, that specifically speaks to this. It's actually, it, it, it's not as boring as it sounds, I promise. It's a, uh, a work of fiction. It's a novel um, based on project management techniques. I oh. promise it's not as boring <laughs> as it sounds. Um, Tyler, get I, the buzzer. Uh, <laughs> um, it's called there it is it's called uh the unicorn project by gene kim um so i think this it, anyway this is just one that that uh, comes to my mind but it's specifically about that it's about a giant corporation that was not born digital overcoming and, and attacking the problems they face trying to become that digital organization um so if, if anybody's interested, I, I, I found it a really good read. And there's a follow-on as well. So there's the Phoenix Project and the Unicorn Project. They're great right. books. I thoroughly enjoyed them. That's cool. super interesting. I, I won't bring that to our team because I keep trying to bring them like books and reading material. And, right. and people are like, what, 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 do you think you're a high school teacher or something? Like so, uh, <laughs> But I'll read it. I'll certainly read it. That sounds actually very, uh, very unique and interesting. Yeah, the um, audio book in particular is very good. That's how I listen to it. I, I'm, I'm on an audio book kick at the moment. But there we go. Oh, oh yeah. That's that's an automation that has been very useful. I suppose it's not automated, but you can kind of go on a walk or cook or do whatever uh, and listen to I've an two, audio book at the same time. I have two under two, so it's the only way I get to read a book these days. <laughs> <laughs> or at least one without pictures in it. Yeah, quite. Right. <laughs> oh, no, I could I could recite all of those from memory. That's fine. <laughs> Well, just, uh, you know, we're, we're at about 35 minutes, and I think we want to kind of keep this roughly around this time, but I just kind of want to round it out with some some hypotheses and, and in, in your guys' completely objective and infallible uh, opinions. What are we expecting to see from AI ops, from automation in the next two, three, four, five years? Um, do you guys have any... Thoughts about where that might go, optimistic or or um, maybe more grounded in reality or, or whatever it is. I, I'll jump in 
first because I like to talk uh, Irish guy. Um, no, for for me, I'm optimistic. Um, for me, what I'm I'm really excited about is the evolution that we're going to see and the revolution we're going to see in in um, the platform products. So as AI ops becomes more than just what people are hoping to achieve. When we start seeing products come to market that really do leverage an AI ops powered platform, that's when things get really, really exciting. Um, because not not because of that, because that in itself itself is exciting, but actually because what are people going to do with all the free time? What are people going to do with the innovation time they've now freed up? Um, mm -hmm. So I think that is going to be a fascinating journey to watch, uh, and that's what's what's keeping me excited. I completely completely 100% agree. I think, so in the short term, I don't think this is going to be an overnight transition. It, no. Again, the, the, this whole SAP being automated, it's going to take a couple of years for people to, to really start to grasp hold of this. But to your point, Brenton, when people do finally um, start utilizing automation in their, in their SAP mm -hmm. world, what that's going to mean to the business, I think, this is going to be really cool. Is the people, because I think people are concerned, like, oh my gosh, am I going to automate myself out of a job? No, <laughs> you're going to automate yourself into yeah. being able to do something cooler. You're going to be able to yeah. go into certifications. You're going to also, all the project work that you you know want to do and these big things you may always want to do just didn't have time or always had to do them last minute and kind of rush through them. Mm. Now these things are going to be smoother. I, I, I guarantee, like, you know, migrations and things like that are going to be a lot more smoother. People are going to have time to focus on these things. And, you know, we're then going to see a lot more. Um, I think steady state is going to be better because uh, people will be able to focus on on making sure things are done correctly the first time. Yeah. So I think it's going to be really cool when, when people start to to um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Absorb. Embrace. 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 Thank you. Embrace. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Totally. I and I I know the you know manual work is a part of every job, and I think that's you know I spend enough time with that. I'm sure you guys do too, and and I'm sure anybody listening to this has some stuff that they're doing every day, whether that's in an SAP context or a Gmail context or whatever mm -hmm. it is um, that, that gets burdensome and that gets kind of tedious. And um, I am, I am just certainly excited to see the sort of liberation of manual labor and, and, ha and being able to kind of, uh, you know, use our digital tools to the fullest extent. Um, cool. So that's su super exciting stuff, guys. And, and um, I think we're going to round this out right now. Uh, so thank you so much for everybody who's been able to join us live and, and who's listened to this. Uh, if you have colleagues or friends or, or anybody who you think may find this interesting, feel free to share with them um, and join us next week. We're wow. going to be here, I believe, at the same time uh, talking about Rise with SAP, which kind of goes... Uh, a, a little similar to some of the stuff of business transformation. And um, I'm sure most of you have heard of Rise With already, but um, we're going to kind of dive into that and what that means. So um, that'll do it for us this week. Any any parting words, gentlemen? Max, I guess just a quick question for you, just to clarify. The next one's next week, not next year, correct? Yes, it is. It is. It is. <laughs> Okay. It's actually Clear. March 10th of 2022. We're going to oh, yeah. push it back. I got a lot of manual tasks to get to this week, so we're going to have to push that one out. Uh, and my parting word is, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> we're out. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, well. everyone. Bye-bye.